Hey, how's it going, guys uh, and gals, of course. Um, so I really wanted to make a video about the epsilon delta definition of a limit. Um, I was originally going to film it on the whiteboard. In fact, uh, if you look over here, you can see the epsilon delta definition over there on the whiteboard. But I just decided, uh, actually, that it's going to be easier if I just walk you through uh, the teaching of someone else um, and kind of make it a little bit more detailed. Uh, this is not competition math related, uh, at least as far as the uh, AMC goes or similar high school or middle school contests. Um, it's just something that I kind of I kind of enjoy. And so uh, a little bit of a background on this limit. Um, I, I often tell students that I teach in calculus and I'm not like the best calc teacher or anything that at least in the first semester, this might be uh, the most difficult thing that you have to learn, uh, depending on how much time your teacher spends on it. Different AP Calc teachers spend different amounts of time on it. Um, and I remember when I was even in college going over this again, I had had a little break since high school when I went, that it was really difficult to grasp. And if you take a college calculus course, you're definitely going to have to spend a lot of time you know, at least a day of problems that you're going to be assigned going through it. High school courses may, may adjust from that, whether you're in A, B, or B, C, and depending on what school and teacher you have and all of that. Um, as far as I know, I don't believe it appears on the AP test itself. Um, but one thing I wanted to mention is that it's entirely possible to get a five on the AP exam and get an A in your AP, AB, or BC calc class, or whatever kind of calc class you might be taking, and really not understand this epsilon delta definition of a limit at all. And so I, I, I understand that you can get by with an A and, and never grasp it. How do I know? Because I did it. When I was in college at, at the uh, university that I was at, I didn't really feel like the teacher explained it that well. It was kind of glossed over and they didn't really do a good job of breaking down what's happening and why this works. And so it was a little bit lost on me and I tried to self-teach it at that time, but I wasn't able to. And there, I couldn't find a lot of good sources online that explained it either. And so that's why I wanted to make this video um, to kind of give you guys a little bit better idea of what's going on and how to apply it but I also wanted to provide you the exception that if you fail to fully grasp this, let's say you only get it at 60 to 70% level, um, your in-depth understanding of calculus is probably going to uh, like suffer as a consequence. Uh, however, you should still be able to get an A on the, uh, in, in the class and, and pull a five on your AP if you don't intend on pursuing a math degree or something like that. So. Uh, let's get started in this. Uh, this right here is a, a uh, copy of a few pages from the, uh, like the uh, book Calculus. It is, a, it is a 10th edition calc book from Larson. If you guys don't know who Larson is, I'll show you a couple of his books here. Um, he's done several collaborations with Larson, Hostetler, and Edwards. This was the one I actually used when I was in college. It's a seventh edition. You can find these used on Amazon for about five bucks. Um, I really like the way these authors write their books. Um, the thing I've noticed is that this is another one from a local class. They use this book here for their AB course, which is why I've labeled it up here. Um, this was a newer edition, Calculus of a Single Variable, cool cover and all that. Um, but the thing I've noticed is the books don't change that much over time. You're not, they're, most of them are 99% the same. They might have swapped out like it's 3x instead of 5x or something like that in a problem. But most of the explanatory portion is just copied and pasted from book to book. And I'll let you speculate about why that is. I'm not going to get into that. Um, there are other calculus authors. Um, another one that people use a lot, in fact, the BC class locally. Uh, uses this one, and I will share screen to it briefly. Uh, new share to here is James Stewart. Um, so James Stewart, uh, a lot of people like it. You can see five-star ratings, uh, four-star ratings for this one with the 178 uh, ratings on it. Um, another one up here, pretty close to five-star with a 1,000 ratings. So a lot of people liked 
uh, what James Stewart had to offer. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't really like it. Um, the, if you do, great. And I'm sure that people who are really going to be math majors use plan on, plan on spending, you know, four or five years in college proving all of the different things you can prove with that line of work or getting your PhD. This might be a great book for such people. But let's say for the average student who's just trying to add one more accolade to their college apps, I don't really feel this does a good job, especially if your pre-calculus course was not rigorous, um, even if it was honors. Uh, the reason why I don't like this, and this is my opinion, again, you might feel differently if you use this book. Uh, Stewart tends to just make the questions ridiculously difficult right from the start. So you'll learn a topic and it's explained with the most, I don't know, difficult language to grasp in my opinion. And then when you get the problem set, number one, let's say that the difficulty ranges from A to Z, right? Question number one will be a C level difficulty. And then the next question will be an M level difficulty. And then by the third question, you're doing like, you know, T and Y and those kinds of level of way more difficult than it really needs to be. And I feel like for students who aren't like, they don't just love math to death, that uh, it's gonna be hard for them to gain confidence in themselves when they're going through the problem sets that he has put in his text. Um, now, if again, if you really grasp math, math at a deep fundamental level, this might be a great book for you. It is going to be, you know, uh, if, if um, for example, if uh, Larson makes a problem that's like 3x squared plus 2x plus one, take the derivative, um, Stewart's equivalent would be 3.2 pi x squared plus 2.173 root 5 x. You know, just it just does extra stuff like that that I just don't feel is needed for the students who are trying to fully grasp it. So uh, with that being said, let's look over at Larson's book as well on Amazon. You can see the seventh edition. This is the new price you're looking at here. Down here, more buying choices. You can find these books for about $5. Um, I think they do a great job. The problem sets are more like A-level difficulty, A-level, 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 B. And then it just gradually increases the difficulty so that the student doing it can practice the fundamentals and get to it. And so as a result, I'm going to be using his text um, to go through this. And I highly recommend it to pick it up if you're going through Calc for the first time. You know what you might even do is do the Larson book first and then switch to the Stewart if you really wanna get those difficult looking problems um, that in my opinion have a little bit too much extra uh, for, for most people. But again, you might feel otherwise and you're entirely, entirely entitled to that opinion. And it might even be more valid than mine. Mine's just my opinion, you know, what does that work? So let's get started. Uh, this will be the um, epsilon delta definition of a limit. And so we're just gonna get started. I'm just gonna go through the text and read it with you, kind of like I was teaching a student for the first time to go through this. And let's see, you tell me if you can leave in the comments, do you feel like after seeing this video, you have a firmer grasp of how the epsilon delta definition of a limit works? I will try and do a few examples in the text as well. So uh, it will annotate a formal definition of a limit. Consider again, the informal definition of a limit. Basically if f of x, and again, when you're reading, you, this is how you should be studying. You wanna translate what they say, right? And this is something simpler, why, right? Uh, uh, why, it's not always gonna be why, right? It really technically, it should be f of x, but you can Mickey Mouse the language, if you will, so that you can get an initial grasp on it before turning and applying it to all functions that may not necessarily have a y value, quote unquote. If f of x becomes arbitrarily close, so like y, if you look at this picture over here, right? Here is L, okay? And if your y value uh, becomes arbitrarily close to a single number L, what is L? It's a specific y value. As X is approaching C from either side, what's C? Well, we can see that C is just a particular X value or it represents a particular X value. Um, then the limit of F of X, right? The function, right? The Y value 
as x approaches c is l. And you write that just like this. So I'm going to read it out loud. How would you read this? It's the limit as x approaches c, the arrow means approaches, of f of x is equal to l. And so what we want to understand is that c is a particular x value and l is a particular y value. OK, again, not all limits require X and Y values. You can have different functions with T and things like that. They don't all require it. But for now, just think of it as X and Y. It'll be easier for you to grasp the concept. OK, so now at first glance, it says this definition looks fairly technical. Even so, it is informal because exact meanings have not yet been given to the two phrases. F of X becomes arbitrarily close to L and X approaches C. What do those things mean? So now we're going to get into it, along with who created this definition. Uh, the first person to assign mathematically rigorous meanings to these two phrases was Augustin Louis Cauchy. OK, and so, uh, yeah, by the way, if you try to look up how to pronounce these names online, there's a lot of mispronunciations. Find a French person pronouncing it because the name is French. OK. Uh, his epsilon delta definition of a limit, that little E thing going this way is a lowercase epsilon, and the D looking thing with the extra curl on the top, that's a delta. And I'm drawing on the side of my screen, like writing straight forward on it, like this angle. It's kind of hard to write nicely, so you'll have to deal with that. Um, is the standard used today? Okay. So we look at figure 1.12, let epsilon, the lowercase Greek it tells you here, represent a small positive number, okay? So it's just a small amount. We don't know what it is. It could be 0 0.1, it could be 0 0.01, it could be anything, right? But just a small number, okay? Um, then the phrase f of x becomes arbitrarily close to L means that f of x lies in this interval. Again, in interval notation, this is like the leftmost and rightmost, or for y values, it'd be the bottom value and the top value. Um, using absolute value, you can write this like this. And so that, this right here, when you read it, you probably want to read it as the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. What I want you to do is reconsider that re reading of it. Reconsider that thinking of it. And instead, go with the geometric definition where this is the distance between f of x and what we are calling l, the limit. We want the distance between the point that you're at, say you're right here on the graph, and this being where l is located, the y value where l is, we want the distance between where you are and the limit to be within this range, less than epsilon, right? Um, so I, how far away am I from this letter L? I am either up epsilon or down epsilon from that value, the Y value, right? Okay, so you're within there and we move forward. Similarly, the phrase X approaches C means that there exists a positive number delta such that X lies in the interval C minus delta to C or the interval C, C plus delta, okay? So X is somewhere between, uh, if this is the X value that you're wanting to approach, you're within a distance of delta on either side of that. So what is delta? It's a small increment, also a small positive number, um, and you're within that distance from your desired approach value, right? So for example, I might say the limit as X approaches two, then I wanna be within a certain distance of two. That's what we're saying. OK, and so this fact can be concisely expressed by the double inequality. This is going to be, again, the distance between X and C. And what is that? That C is the particular X value you're approaching. X is the value you're currently at, right? It's your current X value that you're at right now or while you're approaching it and the C value that you're trying to approach. I want the distance that X is away from that C value to be positive, meaning more than zero, but less than delta. I want to be within a delta's distance of that, um, of that x value, that particular x value, OK? So now we're going to continue scrolling down. Um, I don't want that. Let's scroll up. Well, I guess scroll the page up, but we're going down. It's kind of weird. I'm moving my fingers up with the page. You get what I'm saying. OK, so then we can say, um, yeah, I don't care about acrobat detected. Okay, so we can say that 
uh, X does not necessarily equal C, okay? Expresses the fact um, that X, okay, X actually not equal to C, right? I got distracted by the Adobe thing there. Um, I hate pop-ups. Uh, anyhow, so it's not equal to C. It's close to C, but not equal to C, the X value that you're at. So you're within a distance of delta of C. Now, this is the, the definition that we're going to use. Here we go, all right? Don't be afraid, it's gonna be fine. Let F be a function defined on an open interval. Again, open interval just means like if you're going from three to five, not including the endpoints three and five, okay? Uh, containing C. So in this case, we could say C is four, right? If I'm using this interval. This is not an ordered pair, it's interval notation. You should be familiar with that by now, um, except possibly at C. So it might not, um, it's a function on an open interval, Okay, and let L be a real number. Okay, so again, what is L? It's a Y value. This statement, the limit as X approaches C of F of X equals L, and this is where it gets weird, right, which should be good so far, means that for each epsilon greater than zero, there exists, there isn't at least one, a delta greater than zero, such that if the distance, um, that X is away from C is with it's a positive distance, but it's less than Delta away, then I guarantee you, if you do this, this is the if then format, right? This is the if, this is the then, right? They even say it here, then. Then your Y value will be no more, it'll be less than actually, not even no more. It's less than an epsilon's distance away from the limit. If you can guarantee that, the limit exists. And if you can't, the limit does not exist. Briefly, let's see how it would not exist. What if I had, uh, you know, the absolute value of x over x function? And so you've got a y value, uh, y and x axis, it would be uh, constantly negative one up until you get to zero and constantly positive one when you are over here. So if you pick a positive x value, you get positive one. If you can negative x value, you get negative one. Now, if somebody tried to claim that the limit as x approaches zero of this function is equal to one, we could prove them wrong, right? You are saying that if you're within a certain distance, right? Let's say that I want epsilon to equal 0 0.01, right? Uh, the, one person, it's kind of like a game. One person says, okay, I choose epsilon to be 0 0.01. You show me the delta you can use where it will always be, my, my Y value will always be within this distance of what you claim, okay? Now, so you try to come up with one. You say, okay, I pick, you know, um, a delta of, you know, whatever, 0 0.005 or something like that, okay? But this doesn't work, why? Because if I'm at the X value, negative 0 0.005, you will not be within this distance of the limit. You will actually be down here at the negative one value for Y or the output value of the function. And since you're not within this distance, this Delta does not accomplish the task, right? If I let, um, if I let uh, the Delta value uh, X equals negative, if I let delta equal this, right, um, that value 0 0.005, and you go, let's say you even went closer, sorry, so negative 0 0.004, but you're still going to be at a y value of one, you are not in the y value range of 0 0.99 to 1.01, which is where you said you would be if the limit really existed. Okay, so this is a non-existence of a limit as X approaches zero. What we say is that the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit as X approaches zero are not equal and therefore the limit does not exist. Now we're not gonna get too in depth into the existence of a limit beyond that conversation. Let's move on with this definition. So, oops, uh, I wanna clear and then take off annotation so I can scroll. All right, um, throughout this text, it says uh, this statement, the expression equals L implies two statements. The limit exists and the limit is L. This is that kind of funny thing, by the way. You can have limits that are equal to infinity, but guess what? They still don't exist. And the reason is an actual infinity does not exist. 
So you might say for one limit, you know, when you're writing, let me annotate again real quick, the limit as x approaches one of f of x equals infinity. And what does this mean? It would be a graph that goes something like this. You're at one, you've got a vertical asymptote, one graph's going up like this, other graph's going there. Again, this over here, the L value is your Y value. And what we mean by this is if I'm on a car, right, on this track, this red car over here, and I'm traveling on the roller coaster track of the X values to the right of one, and I'm approaching this X equals one value, where is the car going, right? Where is the roller coaster going? You are going up to an infinitely large Y value and that's why we say it goes to infinity. Other times we could have a limit um, as let's say X approaches two of F of X equals and nothing. You would say it does not exist or DNE. And this would be something like if I was approaching two and I still had an asymptote, let's say one of the graphs is going up and the other graph is going down. Again, the left and right hand limits are not approaching the same value, so we can't write anything. We just says does not exist. But the funny thing is, is that this infinity answer over here does not imply the existence of the limit, all right? It doesn't, it doesn't exist actually when it's approaching infinity either. It's just that we can provide more information. We can say not only does it not exist, but it does approach infinity. This one, we can't, we can't write anything else. We just write does not exist. We could add that the limit as X approaches to from the left and from the right do not agree. And therefore the limit does not exist. And there'll be more later on in this book and other places where you can look at uh, the re requirements for the existence of a limit. Let's get back to this definition now. Okay, so uh, it exists and the limit is L. I'm gonna use the arrow key. For some reason, Adobe won't let me uh, scroll down to the next page. I have to arrow down to it. Okay, so let's look at an example of how this works. Okay, um, this is finding a delta for a given epsilon. Okay, example six from Larson's book. Uh, he may have written it with other people too. I don't remember this book. I think they had, uh, you know, if Hostetler and Edwards assisted him or not. They, I think they recently might not be collaborating, but they did for like, I don't know, 15 years or so, uh, at more or at least. Okay. So given the limit, let's look at this real quick. The limit as X approaches three, okay? Again, that's your C value. The formal definition is the limit as X approaches C of F of X equals L. So when you look at this, compare this to this statement. What are these things then? We should be able to identify. C is three because it's in the same position as three. F of X is two X minus five. Um, the L is one. Those are all the things we can identify from comparing the statement about the generic limit statement to what this is. Now, we are asked to find delta. So you're finding a delta value such that, what is this again? Let's identify what these things are so we can understand. This is how you self-teach too, by the way. And to be honest, self-teaching is a critical skill in college. You're probably going to oversleep some classes. I'm not going to lie. I mean, you're a college kid. You might be out late with friends. You shouldn't be, but you might be. Or you could be sick, or you could oversleep, or your alarm doesn't go off. It's a new environment. Things happen, right? So uh, you might have to self-teach a missed lesson or two if it's not recorded because we're in the COVID era and all that kind of stuff. Um, so be able to do what I'm doing right now. This is an important skill. Also, yeah, that's just, just for that reason. Um, so uh, you might not have a teacher that you find very good at teaching, and you might have to supplement that by self-teaching. A lot of times, especially in the, in, the, in the teachers and professorships and stuff like that, a lot of them have forgotten what it was like to learn something for the first time. They know it so well that to them it's so basic, but for you, it could be revolutionary and difficult, and they don't have that view of it anymore. So it's hard for them to realize where you're getting hung up on some of these things. So please understand that about them. They're not intentionally not teaching well, they've just probably forgotten what it looks like from a novice's perspective. Okay, so we're going to find delta such that, what is that? We set it right here, it's f of x. So what are we looking at? We're looking at f of x in absolute value minus one. What's one? We said it was the limit. So this is this, we're looking at the 
distance between f of x and l. And we want that to be less than 0 0.01. What is this? If we go back to the definition of a limit, I will try and take off the annotate and click the up arrow to go up one page. You can see that what we wrote, again, I'll go back to annotate. What we wrote right here is what's written right here, okay? This is what we want to happen. This is the then part of our if then conditional statement. The if part is this. So I'm asked to find this part that makes this always happen. I always have to have this happen, okay? That's what's going on here, okay? So let's go back down and look at that part. I wish I could just scroll, but uh, thanks Adobe. I guess that's not possible. I will exit out of that and I will hit the arrow key and come back down, okay? So now what? We're looking at this right here is the epsilon value. That's what 0.01 is. Again, it's like a game. Somebody is picking. You're claiming that the limit is one, let's say. And someone, you're asking someone to challenge you. And you say, go ahead, pick an epsilon. This is really the most important part right here, right? This kind of concept of thinking of it like a game. You say, go ahead, pick any epsilon you want. And they say, okay, fine. I will pick epsilon equals 0.01. All right, so what's your delta? Right, you pick the delta. If you're so sure that the limit is one, why don't you give me a delta that will always ensure that no matter where you're at on the X values within one delta of C, which in this case is three, that I will always be within this distance of what you're claiming the limit is, that is one, okay? So let's, if the limit is one, as we're saying, the L is one and the epsilon is 0.01, we would be on the interval uh, 0 0.99, not inclusive, to 1.01. By making the claim that the limit is one, you are saying, okay, that if somebody picked any epsilon, such as 0 0.01 in this case, that you could find a delta or more than one delta that would ensure that if your x value is on the interval x minus, or I'm sorry, not x minus, but c minus, c minus delta to c plus delta. If your choice for x is anywhere on this open interval, then the y value output of that, of that x value plugged into the function, right? Whatever x value that is, it's a particular x value. You pick one on there, I am guaranteeing that the Y value output will be between 0 0.9 and 1.01. .01. That's what it means to have a limit. That's what it means to have a limit. Okay, so now let's get farther into this. So it says whenever. Now I'm used to if then where the if comes first, but they're kind of giving the then first. This is the then, this is the if down here. And so whenever the what is this x minus three in absolute value? It's the distance between x and three, but what is it in the generic abstract sense? It's the distance between a particular x value and c. c meaning the value that x is approaching. This three right here is that three right there, okay? Make sure you understand that. And you're saying that the distance between x and my chosen approached value of C. Okay, C is a X value. It's an X value that you're approaching. You are saying that the distance between there, as long as it's positive, not zero, but less than Delta, then you are guaranteeing the Y value output will be between 0 0.9 and 1.01. .01. Let's see now if we can establish what that Delta could be. And there's probably more than one value. There, there almost all the time is. Okay, so um, let's erase some things here, get rid of this, and I don't need this circle, I don't need that, I don't need, let's get rid of that too, okay? All right, now, so we're gonna work through their solution, right? We're gonna try and read through it here. So actually, I'll try and do it with that, I'll try and paraphrase what they're doing. So uh, we're gonna go to this expression that they gave us here. Let's erase all these arrows and protein and all that kind of stuff. And if you look at this, two X minus five minus one. Again, what was that? That was the uh, f of x minus l, okay? It's this right here, 
That's all it is. And here's the epsilon that we saw from the uh, definition. Okay. Go back in the video or whatever and, and look it up in your book to see it or look it up online. Um, I'm not going to go up a page right now. Okay. So uh, if I take f of x minus l, I will get 2x minus 6 in absolute value is less than 0 0.01. Okay, so if I want this to happen, right, this is my desired result, then why don't I factor out a two from the absolute value? And what I noticed is this will almost always happen. I don't know if it always 100% of the time will, but basically it happened almost every problem I ever did. So you've now got it written like this with that two factored out. And you might not know it, but I wanna write it over here. If you have the absolute value of A times B, that is equal to the absolute value of A times the absolute value of B. I can separate it into two absolute values. And now we have that situation here where two is like the A and X minus three is like the B, okay? So I'm gonna maybe erase up here so I have some space. Sorry that I'm not all over the board, but there's just not enough space when you're writing next to another screen to do this. So now I'm gonna separate out that two and you've got the X minus three and you still got less than 0 0.01. Now I'm gonna just, the two is not, does not need absolute value. You agree, I hope. And we're gonna simply divide by two and you get X minus three in absolute value is less than 0 0.005 because 0 0.01 cut in half is 0 0.005. Okay, so this is the delta value, right? It's right here x minus three, x minus three. This was the goal. The thing right there that we're less than is the delta value. So we claim, fine, you chose an epsilon of 0 0.01 right over here. That's your epsilon choice. No problem. I choose epsilon of 0 0.005 or a delta rather. That's my delta choice. I will say delta equals 0 0.005. Now, if I'm right about my claim that the limit is one, then if you pick any X value within this distance, okay, that's going to be what? We're going from the value of three. So if I take away 0 0.005, you are on the interval 2.995 to 3.005, okay? I am claiming that if your X value comes anywhere on that, go ahead, get it, pause the video, get a calculator right now, plug in any value within there. You cannot choose the endpoints, but you could choose 2.996 or 2.996135712. You know, all of those things, as long as you're in that interval for X, 100% of the values that you check will be between an output value of 0.99 and 1.01. .01. And if they're not, assuming you did it correctly, then the limit is not one. That's not the limit, okay? Does that make sense? If we can't do this, if I can't find the delta that makes that happen, that's when the limit doesn't exist. That's why on this graph here, when x was one this way, open dot, open dot, negative one, the limit didn't exist because there is no delta that will satisfy every choice of, actually any choice of epsilon. If you choose any value of epsilon, that's less than, I guess, two, you know, or something, because the, the gap here between the y values is two, uh, if you did that, but usually you're dealing with small values for epsilon and for delta, okay? So uh, let's look a little bit more at this then. Um, what goes on next. And let's read their solution and see what additional insight they provide. So um, here we go, draw. And try to establish connections. So you take this given statement here, they gave us this, right? And you're gonna get it to look, to compare it to this. So what did we do? We combined the two X minus six, we pulled the two outside. Now you can take this statement and show them that it's equivalent to this statement. And now you're gonna divide by two, which is 0 0.005. And it says this choice works. Notice this, this is the if. If the distance between X and three is positive, but less than 0 0.05, between zero and 0 0.005 inclusive, that implies that. In other words, if it's implying, that's the then state. 
then this statement will always be less than 0 0.01. That's it. That would be the delta that shows that that limit really is the limit. That one value, the candidate for the limit, if you will, really is the limit. Okay, let's scroll down and look at a little bit more of this. Um, and from a graphical look, what does it look like? So as you can see in figure 1.13, that's this one, um, for x values within here of three, right? So look at the values they've got, 2.995 and 3.005. That is what we said. That was the, the uh, interval of x values we were looking at. You can see that the output values are always between 0 0.99 and 1.01, 1 .01, or the values of f of x, or output, or y, whatever you want to call it, are within. And what was 0 0.01? It was epsilon. So it's within an epsilon of what was 1? One? 1 was L. When you are self teaching, do not read it like a Harry Potter novel. Okay, if, assuming you read those books. I didn't actually read them. But, you know, it's not a pleasure reading, right? You're going to have to make sense of what you're reading, connecting the symbols. Don't see within 0 0.01 of 1 and not realize this is epsilon and the limit. You have to connect these things. You have to make the web of understanding interconnected so you can travel on it every which way and you will understand fundamentally what is going on. Let's look at another example um, going down again. Okay, now this is going to use the epsilon delta definition of a limit, but now we're going to be doing some kind of proof. Um, in example six, it says you found a delta value for a given epsilon. This is the last example we're going to do, by the way. I'm not going to get into all of the intricate ways that you can have. Like example eight actually is a little bit more intricate. Um, it requires a little bit more thought and connecting various things. I just want to get the basics of the epsilon delta definition down so you can understand it and at least try these problems out right on your own. In fact, I would recommend if you've got the calc book, find the epsilon delta section. It could be in an appendix in the back or it could be in the front. Give it a try. Give these questions a try. Try to do as many of them as you can. The more you do, the more comfort you will have with the idea. Um, so here we go. Uh, use the epsilon delta definition of a limit to prove that the limit as x approaches 2. Again, let's diagram. What are these things? C is 2. F of x is 3x minus 2. L is 4. Compare it to the statement about the, the uh, statement about limits. Again, that would be the limit as x approaches C of f of x equals L. If that's a true statement right there that we just wrote, then we would be able to do what the epsilon delta definition said. We could find a delta such that as long as we're within a delta's distance of the chosen C value, your output value, the function's value, will be within a, a epsilon's distance of the limit. Right? We're, we're, we're asserting that that's true. Let's again play this game out. Okay, so. Uh, we want to show, we're trying to prove that this is true, okay? So now, when you're doing proofs, especially these kind, this is not ge geometry two column proofs anymore. You're going to have to do writing, you have to write, write, write things out, do sentences, justify your reasoning. Um, it's actually maybe even a little bit more beautiful. Two column proofs in geo, which is an American thing, U.S. standard. Uh, I actually like them. I think they're good structure. In fact, if you think about it, the proofs that you do without two column proofs um, are, in fact, it could be built upon the structure that you created, the backbone using that two-column proof. So, uh, but just be aware that as you move beyond geometry, especially in, in uh, university, nobody uses two-column proofs anymore. Okay, so you must show, okay, the, the format for this proof is teacher conditional. Your teacher is going to tell you what way they want you to write it. For example, I had a teacher in college that said we can write WWTST. And he said it was you know, formally accepted most places as we want to show that, okay? So then this might be written as we want to show that for each epsilon. This time, we don't know what epsilon is. Now it's this even more abstract. It's this unknown value. 
any epsilon you choose, there is definitely a delta. Because we're not, the last one we had a specific epsilon of 0 0.01. Now we no longer have that. Now we're making the claim that we don't, uh, the, the first problem, example six, was not really a proof, right? It kind of establishes it, but this is more of a proof right here, okay? Because that one was only for the case that 0 0.01 was epsilon. What if you had picked a different epsilon? So the aim of this example is to show you that any epsilon somebody picked, you could pick a viable delta. Let's get to it. Okay, so you must show that for each epsilon, there exists a delta greater than zero such that, again, what is this? This is f of x minus l is less than epsilon whenever. Okay, again, it's weird because this is the then. This is the then, the if is this. So if you do this, the outcome will be this, okay? So uh, whenever the X is within a delta's distance of the approached X value, don't forget always that C is an X value, L is a Y value, all right? And again, I'm, I'm kind of simplifying that because it's obviously not true that you always have X and Y values. Sometimes you're using different variables, but just to, it's kind of intuitive. You have input and output, okay? So C would be an input value that you're approaching, L is an output value that you are within an epsilon's distance of, okay? So here we go. Because your choice of delta depends on epsilon, you need to establish a connection between this statement here and this one here. Again, when you're reading, don't read this and not walk it back to connect it to the previous things you read. Do you want to understand or not, right? Make sure you're doing those kinds of things in all of your self-study. Okay, and all of your self-study. So let's kind of get to it then. Uh, again, the, the language of the sentences that you write would be different per teacher. Uh, there's probably maybe some universally accepted things, but you would have to modify it to match your teacher. What I would do if you don't have access to a teacher who's demanding you do these kinds of proofs, buy one of the books. Uh, again, I will link them like this. This one has epsilon delta problems in the appendix of the book and then practice the problems thereby and mimic their solution writing. Whatever they write, that must be accepted. These guys are PhD holders, they're brilliant, right? So if that's the way they're writing their solutions, you learn to imitate it until you no longer have to imitate it. Then it becomes your own, okay? That's the goal, okay? So now you might even write, be, ha have to write a sentence like this because our choice or your choice of delta depends on epsilon. You need to establish a connection between f of x minus l's absolute value or distance between and the distance between x and c, which is okay, two. Okay, don't be afraid to reread parts again and again, connecting it to all of the things that you understand it's connected to. It will enrich your understanding. Okay, so here we go. Just do what we did in the previous one, right? We start here, obviously minus two and minus four is minus six. We pull the three to the outside. We have three times the absolute value. What are we gonna do? We're gonna take this three times the absolute value of X minus two, which is equivalent to this left-hand part. I'll put it in a different color so you can see it. This left-hand part in green, that is equivalent to this. Now we want that to be less than any unknown epsilon, because we don't know who our adversary is going to be, the contrarian. Oh, well, you couldn't do it for epsilon equal to such and such. Well, our goal is to be ready for that contrarian, right? And you're going to divide by three and divide by three. Notice what it says. The absolute value of x minus two is less than epsilon over three which looks like a backwards three over a three, the way we wrote it on the screen. Uh, we don't have access to fancy scripts with our handwriting, right? So uh, by the way, you're not gonna probably ever write the nicest delta unless you've had calligraphy classes. And if you have, good for you. Uh, okay, so uh, again, we said don't just call this absolute value. Now I did that intentionally to mix up the way I'm explaining it, but this should be thought of as the distance between X and two, and two is the value that X is supposed to be approaching that we're trying to establish that limit is four. Here's the crux of it. You let Delta equal Epsilon over three. Now we are ready. They say Epsilon is 0 0.01. Then we say Delta is 0 0.01 over three. 
they say epsilon is 0 0.00004, then you say delta is uh, 0 0.00004 over three. And it doesn't matter what they pick, you just divide it by three. Uh, I can do this all day, right? That's the goal. You want to have it like that. There's not really anybody challenging you. It's a fictitious thing to give you an analogy, okay? But you are ready. This is the chosen delta. And what did we say at the beginning? Let's erase all of this and go back now to look at it. Um, we wanted to show that for each epsilon greater than zero, zero, there exists a delta. Is there more than one? Sure, there is. There's more than one delta. You could do uh, epsilon divided by four would have also accomplished it. But this is the, uh, the, the farthest out that you could go to have it, okay? And so we choose delta equals epsilon over three. And so they write here, this is to clean up the proof now, right? So for a given epsilon greater than zero, you can choose delta equals epsilon divided by three. This is a, you are proposing this. You are saying that this is what's true. And now you're gonna explain why you believe that gives the proof. And it says this choice works because the distance between X and two is greater than zero, but less than delta. Again, we're not saying it's that, it's equal to, that the absolute value is equal to epsilon over three. We, we're still saying it's less than delta. This is the statement, but we are also at the same time saying delta is equal to epsilon over three. In other words, we are really writing it like this. But we're trying to show at the same time that that epsilon over three is actually delta, okay? So that's why they put the delta first and then put equals. Don't get confused by less than and equal it's two different things. You're less than delta and delta is equal to epsilon over three. Now we are saying that this implies that, right? How would it imply it? Um, this is a zero by the way, not a delta. How does this imply what we wanted to imply? That is that this is less than epsilon. Okay, how? We'll just do it in reverse. Multiply by three. You will get three times the absolute value of x. Uh, let's make that a little bit nicer. X minus two is less than epsilon. Now, guess what? We can reverse the process of the absolute value rule. I can put the three back inside. I will get three x minus six less than epsilon. Then I could separate it. I could make it three x minus two. Uh, I'm sorry, three x minus five. No, and three x. That's right. Uh, three, how do we do this? Uh, yeah, three X minus two, that's right. Um, minus four, okay, absolute value. So notice what I did, I took the six and split it to look like this and we're still less than epsilon. And what is this? What is this? By now you should recognize it. It is F of X minus L. We showed that at the distance between F of X and the claimed limit is less than epsilon when you choose delta equal to epsilon over three. And they continue that here, they pull out the three, it's three times epsilon over three, which is less than epsilon. Another way to look at it, the way they kind of set it up is if we wrote, um, let's go to a different color so we can tell the difference here, we'll use orange. If we wrote X minus two, the distance there um, is less than epsilon over three. All they did was multiply the left by three and the right by three. The left by three becomes this, the right by three becomes epsilon. And therefore, this has proven that there exists a delta for every epsilon that someone could make. Um, I hope this helps. I hope this is a good explanation. You let me know. It's my first time making a video explaining the calculus concept. Um, I really, once you understand what this is, this is genius. I, 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 this is beyond, there's, there's, there's smart people and there's genius. And this is genius to think of this idea of a limit. It is absolutely brilliant. Um, if you, once you understand all the things that we have today as a result of calculus, uh, this, this is changing the world. Uh, it might be one of the single most, if not the most uh, mathematically important thing to come up with this idea of a limit, right? It changed the world. I had a college teacher uh, who said, you don't know what calculus is. And I mean, I had heard various people say, but no one had said it like she did. She said, it's the study of limits. I don't know, that was profound to me. Calculus is the study of limits.
Now, maybe there's other people who would vouch for a different explanation, or maybe that's widely accepted, but regardless of which, I mean, she's a professor and it makes sense to me, it is kind of the study of limits. And so if we didn't know what a limit was, how are we gonna study that, right? And so be, based on this, we have all of the technology we have today. You have flight, you have aerodynamics, as so many different things, right? Your world is, is created by this, okay? So try to appreciate this when you're learning this. Try to appreciate what Koshi gave to us um, and what, what this is and, and this formal definition and Newton and Leibniz and all those guys, right? That's what they have provided uh, this video might be a little long. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Please leave a comment and give it a like if you thought this was a good explanation. Um, I will be back to competition math next. If you want to see more of these kinds of videos, please request it in the comments as well. Uh, that way I'll know that you appreciate this kind of stuff and we can do more of this in the future. You guys have a good one. I will link the book in the descriptions so that you can purchase it uh, through affiliate marketing links if you would like. Okay. Uh, that's all for today. We are done here.